Hello and welcome to the newest episode of the Real Deal podcast. We have a special guest with us tonight or today, depending on where you're watching us from. Kian is with us. Sid is with us. Uh, Kian gives us this lovely introduction wherever we are on a live pod or in front of the audience that the man, the myth, the legend is here. Today, actually, the man, the myth, the legend is here. Kian, welcome to the show. And same to you, Sid. Thank you, man. This is awesome. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of this. I always love when I don't have to host because it's just <laughs> less work. I can just chill and sit in and talk and that's it. I don't have to like have the pressure of hosting. So thanks for taking on that responsibility today, Mehdi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, well, today's episode is going to be a lot of it is going to be about Kian's journey as a football journalist, uh, the challenges he has faced, the uh, things that he has enjoyed the most and all those nice things. So let's get into that. This is a very Bellingham heavy podcast. Uh, Sid has a Bellingham poster. The shirt I'm wearing it says Bellingham on the back. Our intro ends with Bellingham, so very Bellingham heavy podcast. But anyways, getting into the things, Kian just mentioned that he enjoys uh, not hosting sometimes because he's always hosting. He hosts the Managing Madrid podcast, also the Churros Tacticas podcast. And even like as a follower, uh, I'm also enjoying hosting you because a lot of the times, uh, Obviously, you do the Q and A's with fans, but as uh, writers and like as followers, we often probably don't get to ask you the questions that we sometimes want. But that's why we have the Real Deal podcast, and we'll do that today. Sid, any thoughts before we start? I mean, just I think Kian, we can all say you've been a very big inspiration in sports media for a lot of people. Um, you've been pretty much like a mini mentor to me in many ways just kind of pushing my work sharing things um you know really respect the way keon hosts it's not easy it's very physically and mentally challenging i honestly believe the more i do it myself like i don't know how you put out all this content man but well done and i'm just excited to hear your journey keon like let's just get into the questions like what when did you start like you've always been a real madrid fan like when did it become a thing that you started to work on like as a career well, first of all, thank you, man. Those are really uh, kind and flattering words. I'm not sure if I'm deserving of that kind of praise, but uh, listen, I, 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 I enjoy speaking with you guys constantly uh, because you're fun to, to work with, you're fun to talk to, and you guys have knowledge of the game. So, you know, it's, it's not hard for me to, to sit down and talk with you guys about anything because it's, you know, like I said, uh, you guys are understanding of the game and how it works but also put out great content and you're fun to talk to. So it means a lot also. So thanks for those words. Um, <clears throat> how did I, what was the question? How did I become, get involved with Real Madrid writing? Is that what it was? Yeah. Like how did you basically get started? Cause well, some of, from some of your podcasts in the past, you have said that you, you started in basketball then mm. transitioned into football, but how did that transition basically happen and what, or what inspired you to make that transition? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I honestly never thought I would uh, be able to do this as a career. Uh, I thought it was just going to be like uh, something on the side that's fun, that maybe it leads to somewhere, maybe it doesn't, but certainly didn't think I was going to be able to like quote a job and, and do it full time. That's for sure. But uh, it also started in a very discouraging manner in that what I, how I initially got into it was that I was in university and I was taking psychology very classic story of like you don't know what you're supposed to do after high school your guidance counselor tells you you have to go to university and all your friends are going to university so like okay i guess this is what i'm gonna do your parents want you to go to university i was like okay that that's i guess what i'm gonna do i have no idea what i'm taking because i don't really know what i'm interested in so you take on psych i took psychology and with psychology like you can picture it like what are you gonna do with psychology really um, 
my initial plan was I wanted to get into child psychology and I felt that there was actually a big need for child psychologists at the time, especially in the sense that I, I don't think many people were bringing a, a spiritual approach to child psychology. Um, and so that was the angle I wanted to work with. At the same time, to be quite honest with you, I was not good at school. Like I was not good at getting grades. Uh, it's just not something that I was very good at. And at that time, the thought of like becoming a child psychologist was like, okay, another 10 years off my life because I had to like go get my master's and then my PhD. It's like what 10 years of, of more of this thing I don't really enjoy. And I realized that a couple of things were happening. Uh, I didn't care enough to like actually study in, in university. I was watching Champions League games instead. I was playing football instead. I was in the gym instead, and uh, all of my classes were picked surrounding the Champions League games. If, if there was a Tuesday or Wednesday class and I needed it to graduate, it would still not be prioritized because it would conflict with Champions League. And I was like, hold on a second. If, if I really just don't care about this that much and I'd rather just be talking about sports, is it possible to do this for a living? Of course, at that time, I didn't have any journalism experience. I had no writing experience. And quite frankly, if you go back and read any of my articles in the past, uh, like I cringe. They're terrible. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I started to apply to places. No one would answer my emails. So I was like, okay, I guess the only way to start is maybe just write my own blog. So I started a, a Toronto Raptors blog, and it was called Raptors Watch. And it actually gained a following. And... Uh, we actually got press credentials, Raptor stuff. And then I, from there, I applied and I, I got a job with uh, Raptors Republic, which at the time, I don't know if it still is, but it, it was part of the ESPN True Hoops Network. So if you go, you can actually read my stuff there. Um, I got a ton of great mentors. Uh, there's the off chance, the 1% chance he's listening to it, like Blake Murphy, who is like the Raptors guy right now, uh, yeah. was a huge mentor of mine just a fantastic guy. And uh, so I learned a lot doing that. I was attending Raptors games and, and doing that. But at the same time, I wanted to do Real Madrid really for a couple of reasons. One, it's because they're my favorite sports team. And two is because I didn't really see many people, if any, doing tactical analysis on Real Madrid at that time anyway. This was like 2015 range. All of my favorite writers are basketball writers. All my favorite uh, media guys or basketball guys and there was no real equivalent of those people in the football industry specifically for Real Madrid and that's kind of the niche I wanted to fill so I remember I, remember I actually sent Lucas Navarrete an email like this overly complicated overly unnecessarily um, lengthy email it was like you know this is my resume this is what I'm going to do and he, he emailed me back he was like hey man I think you're overqualified I, for, for this, this place. I think, uh, you know, we can't pay you. And I was like, it's okay. I'll, I'll do it for free. So I was doing it for free for uh, maybe a year or two. Then I started getting like minimal paid jobs. And then eventually uh, 2018, I think, is the range where I was able to actually do it full time as a career. And I remember kind of where it shifted for me. Sorry, man, this is way, this answer is way too lengthy, but. <clears throat> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the I remember I think it was a Tim Ferriss book I read. I don't remember which book it was now. Was it? I don't think it was Four Hour Work Week. It was one of those Tim Ferriss books. And basically, he had this thing where like you write out where you want to be, and then you work backwards and write down the steps you need to achieve those goals. And I remember, okay, I was like, okay. And he's like, doesn't matter how crazy the goal is. And so I said, okay, I want to in one year be sitting press row at the Bernabeu. And that to me at that time was really crazy because I was a nobody in a small Canadian town. And uh, I was like, one year from now, I wanted to, I want to be there. So I worked backwards. I was like, what do I need to be doing to get to that stage? And I remember meeting that goal. And I remember posting it on LinkedIn. I was so excited um, so that's kind of like the longer version of it. Um, but 2018 range, I, I was able to kind of do it full time. But I, I'm shocked because, again, like I was writing about basketball and I wasn't very good at it. And uh, I guess that's what it took. Yeah, I, like uh, speaking of old articles that 
uh, you think we're cringy. Like I actually pulled up the first email I ever sent to you. <laughs> I'm going to put it up on the screen. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm going to put it up on the screen. So this is me. I'm Mehdi. Uh, and I wrote a couple of fan posts on Managing Madrid. One of them is called Summer at the Bernabeu, <laughs> Early Transfer Reports. And the other is a new metric. XG is changing the way we analyze football. <laughs> <laughs> and Kian That's said, funny. "Like, uh, great job on the fan posts. Keep writing." Uh, so yeah, it's 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 been a, at that time. I didn't know that I'm gonna be like hosting you guys on a podcast someday. But uh, I I, uh, I think I think you're well. a great example too. I mean, like that, like reading that email I sent to you, that might have been discouraging. I don't know. To be quite honest, I don't even answer emails anymore, it's, and I'm not gloating <laughs> about it. And I don't feel proud about saying that because I I really <laughs> wish I could. But I get so many emails like that all the yeah. time, Mahidi. <laughs> uh, but I think your growth is tremendous too. Like I've been, you know, obviously following it for quite some time and uh, everything with the, with Madrid Batar you started. I mean, I, you filled a void also for Bengali speaking Maridistas and people in Bangladesh, but also like you, I don't think anyone's doing Real Madrid visuals like you, uh, especially so quickly after the game. I mean, Yash does great work too. We all know Yash Thakur um, and he's doing great work for both that and, and for the men that and Feminino, but it's, it's, you know, proud to like have you guys both on managing Madrid, but I th your growth has been tremendous too, Mehdi. Thanks, thanks, Kian. Thanks. That that means a lot. Uh, we actually have a question regarding the first time you walked into the Bernabeu. Uh, so the first time you went to the Bernabeu, was it as press or was it as a fan? And also, if said you had a had a question regarding that as well. Yeah, let's start there. Let's start with the, your first time going to the Bernabeu, first few visits. What was it like versus expectations? Yeah, uh, the first time I went was uh, not for a game. It was as a fan doing the stadium tour thing um, years ago before I became a journalist. And that was like a shocking experience because it's like, wow, you're finally here. It's like you don't really realize the magnitude of something until you see it in person, I find. Um, this is a really weird example, but I went to the Taj Mahal once. And when you see, or, or like Grand Canyon, both of these examples work. You, I saw, I've seen pictures of, the Taj Mahal and the Grand Canyon. And you're like, okay, it's obviously like this really amazing thing that's huge. Both of those things, when I saw them in person, I was just like overwhelmed by how massive they were and the magnitude of their beauty and their complexity. I felt that way about the Bernabeu, even though it's not nearly on the level of the Grand Canyon and, and uh, the Taj Mahal. But I kind of just looked up. I was like, wow, this is where it all happens. It was such a, an amazing experience for me. But the first time I went, to an actual game was as a journalist. Although I've been to, I did a few of those US preseason tours when I was a kid. Went back in like the Galactico days. I saw those in person, but not meaningful games. But it was a game against Malaga, a 1 1 draw, I think, where Isco got booed because he was over dribbling. And I, that was as press, it wasn't as a, as a fan. And uh, I just remember being so nervous and anxious because they don't like no one cares like no one gives you a briefing of like this is where you go this is the door you enter this is who you talk to this is how to behave i just had no idea i, I remember the first uh I, I i i got to a certain point at the burnabout and i saw a door i was i think it's in this door and i saw this guy with his back to me facing the door smoking a cigarette and I was like, uh, I thought it was a security guy. I was like, hey, is this the press area? And he turns around and it was Roberto Carlos. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, see, see, entra. And then he like opened the door for me. I was like, what the hell? I was like so shocked. And uh, so, you know, I remember little things like that. But uh, that was my first game. 1-1 one, one, Malaga, I think 2016, I want to say. Something like that. Uh, that was my first experience, man. Yeah. Damn, he's go over dribbling. But Sid, what would you do if you like see someone like if you're at the Bernabeu and you see Marcelo smoking a cigarette and you ask him for directions? I don't even know. Like, I don't know. I think I would just like, I think I would just be stupefied. Like, Jan, I haven't been there, but I have a close friend who went to the Bernabeu and like everything I've heard, it sounds like a mythical, modern, like almost religious location. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. And I have my caption for the short uh, Taj Mahal, Grand Canyon, and the Bernabeu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, someone's going to be angry about that. Like, what are you saying? Are you saying Bernabeu is a wonder now? This guy. 
uh, one of my like one of my co-editors eric he actually went to the banabao at the worst possible time he went for the four nil loss against barca mm. uh, like a couple of seasons back he, he he didn't watch the game but he was at the banabao and he actually brought me a marca copy like a hard copy of marca from the day after where it says like de- devastated or something like that yeah i still have have that in my collection yeah uh, on that note um which players have the coolest auras that you've ever been around or the most imposing auras um to the two that stood out to me seeing them in person were modric and ronaldo uh i ronaldo just has a presence for obvious reasons that you can't really explain uh what i think what struck me about modric is that if you go like watch him warm up before the game everything he does is just so effortless like it's like almost as if he's just acting out as a video game like his brain is the controller or his brain is like the guy the guy using the controller and his feet are the controller if that makes sense like everything is so effortless like you you know like when those videos of Steph Curry before a game warming up where he's shooting threes from crazy angles and going through his routine it's kind of like that cuz like he's taking he's doing these drills with the whole team where you know they're setting up shots for him he's shooting from outside the box they're going like top right corner top right corner top right corner top left corner like his passing he's doing outside the boot passes effortlessly i i feel like modric and cristiano are probably the most impressive um yeah i'll go with those two yeah uh, have you ever like seen zidane play in person like in a live game yeah uh in preseason in the us uh oh. 2005 i think it was in chicago zidane nazario raul owen like that that era yeah like i like you guys know how what kind of a pathetic zidane fan i am but Uh, he was when he was in Montreal with Madrid. I think it was in the sixteen seventeen seasons preseason or the season after. Mm-hmm. Like I like I should have made that trip and go and see the training. Probably could have like taken a photo or something because these things are usually pretty chill, especially yeah. the Montreal thing because like they're not playing any games or anything. They just have a preseason training camp. So yeah, I, I miss that chance. I like I curse myself every day for that. Yeah, I'm I'm honestly not sure they'll come back to Canada. Like I don't. The US thing is such a resounding success every year that I feel like they'll just stay there. Um I don't know. Originally they they started to come into <clears throat> Canada like I don't know if if this is just a myth or it's true that because Ancelotti's wife was Canadian Vancouver, that's why yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why they started to come to Canada and I think they did this camp in 13 14 and then Zidane was the assistant coach at that time and he liked Montreal a lot because people speak fr- French and everything mm. and then they started coming to during his time as well. And well probably we would would never know cuz once covid broke out these camps kind of dim- got diminished anyway and now the team just goes to US straight away. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned Modric and Ronaldo. Um I would imagine that the other two that really stand out are maybe Benzema, Ramos or even a Cruz. Yeah. Um Yeah, I thought of all three of those players, yeah. What what about Marcelo? Like you ever run into him? Is he really fun? Uh So Marcelo, I mean I've never run into him like in terms of the way I read into Roberto Carlos. By the way, Roberto Carlos, you know, the cool thing about US preseason tour is the access. So like during training camp this past summer, the press we were all located like right on the sidelines in training sessions so Roberto Carlos would like just huddle with us in the press and talk as if it was just kind of like some cocktail hour and he's really funny. Like he's always just cracking jokes and a uh, very bubbly personality. I imagine Marcelo would be the same because of what we see. But yeah, Marcelo for sure. Marcelo is another one that could just be doing tricks and training and a lot of fun. I will say like right now, it's so funny because the way the trainings are set up now said is there's two groups doing rondos, like you know, the monkey in the middle kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the players pick their own rondos and it's always the same two groups. And There's so there's the one group is the Spaniards so Carvajal, Jose Lu, Vasquez, Nacho, etc. And then right next to them is the group of Bellingham, Camavinga, Chuameni, uh I think Mendy and Modric is always with those guys. 
So it's like the Spaniards and then there's like Modric and the rest. And the Modric and the rest, it's just so much more fun. Like their presence <laughs> is like so much more entertaining. Like they're always laughing. They're always doing flicks and tricks. Vinicius, Rodrigo, they're all in there too. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen him much in person. I think I've only seen him play twice this season. But Bellingham is another one I'm, I'm excited to kind of just watch more of in person because that's another one that's just so transcendent and such a physically uh, impressive player that I, I'd, I'd like to see more of Bellingham. I feel like he'll fit into that mold. Yep. Yeah. Some of some of the, like outside of the Bernabeu, Kian, some of the stuff we'll pivot to now is managing Madrid itself. Managing Madrid has obviously been a resounding success in the English-speaking Real Madrid universe. I don't think any platform it comes even close to the kind of analysis, reports, content Managing Madrid puts out. Uh, and Managing Madrid is like branching out into different spheres. We obviously have the Las Blancas podcast. We have the Castilla Corner. We have the Real Deal podcast. We are, we are branching out despite being a resounding success itself. So just talk us through a little bit about some of the challenges that you have faced for to bring Managing Madrid to where it is now. And some of the things probably you've enjoyed as well. You obviously have a staff that is very aligned with the vision that you have for the website. And also some of the goals that you see this, this platform accomplishing in the future. Yeah, interesting. I mean, right off the bat, I'll say the first thing is that like the writers... And the podcasters are all at a different level, I think, like to anyone else, like anything anyone else has. Like, there's a couple things. Like, no one is putting out the tactical analysis that you, like, Mehedi said, um, Matt, Yash, like in previous years, um, like these, like it was at a different level. Um, no one else had that kind of brain power, I think, in it. And also the fact that we're on the ground, like, Ewan has been huge. Ewan McTier has been huge for us because before the only people who were going to the games were me and and uh, Lucas. Lucas is in Valencia and I'm in Canada. So I I get out there about once a month and Lucas only like takes a train over if the, if the game is like like if it's like a knockout Champions League game. He's like, "Yeah, this is worth my uh my my train ride is to go see Real Madrid beat City in the semifinal." So like uh I think up until the, that point, before Ewan came, we were just kind of sometimes there. When Ewan joined, it changed completely because our relationship with Real Madrid just went to a different level because Ewan started to go to every single game when we weren't there. And when Real Madrid saw that, they we shifted, I think, in their, their eyes from these like kind of bloggers who want to go to see a free game to oh, these guys are actually going to like a game against the 20th place team at the Bernabeu. Like they're making trips now to, you know, Lucas and I were both at the Derby at the Metropolitano. We're, you know, I'm going to Stamford Bridge, Anfield, wherever they're traveling, the Etihad. And Ewan sometimes goes to like smaller away games like Almeria. And now Sam Leverage is doing that too. I think that was huge for managing Madrid was Ewan actually being there every, every game when we weren't there. That was huge. Um, the other thing is, because uh, you were asking, like, what are the barriers or what were the challenges? The biggest fight to me was and is and will continue to be that we're serving a niche. And that's a small percentage of Real Madrid fans. We don't cater to everybody, right? So our struggle has always been that, like, for people to read our tactical work, we have to bring them in a different way with a little bit of clickbaity headline stuff because no matter what, the traffic still comes from like an Mbappe rumor, right? So like if you look at our traffic, like the like C Trick, for example, I don't know if you guys remember C Trick. C Trick would do tactical reviews for managing which all the time. And he would put so much work into those reviews, like go over film data. It would take him like a couple of days to write nonstop and he would publish it. And that amount of analysis and effort and work that went into producing that, it gets like barely 10% even of the hits 
of a 30 second Mbappe transfer article, right? And that's always been the challenge. It's like, how do we get those people to care about this stuff? And it's a, it's one of those battles that I've, I've, I've started to accept, like you can't really win. You just have to accept that you're always going to cater to a small percentage of the overall fan base. But what you have to do is just kind of increase it, increase that number as much as you can. Because even if it's only 20% of the larger audience, you know, you're still tapping into a lot of people. So that's been one challenge. Um, I think the other challenge has been that we're at the mercy of some things that are out of our control. For example, we're lucky that we support Real Madrid and not Mallorca. Because if we were doing this for Mallorca, for example, there's no way this would sustain itself. No one would care. But it's Real Madrid. But even even though it's Real Madrid is the biggest club in the world, it's still at the mercy of certain things like when Cristiano Ronaldo left us, we lost a ton of traffic. And the Juventus blog on SB Nation gained all of those exact, I think, I can't remember the exact number, but it was this amount of views per month, Man and Jimmy Madrid lost, the Juventus blog gained. So like people just jumped ship, right? And now you see it like with him and Al Nasser. It's, it's, it's just constantly a thing. So we're also at the mercy of like how many stars do we have? If Mbappe joins it, I think it'll be great for us in terms of the podcast. Um, so we're also at the mercy of like all this stuff that happens to, to this day. You remember, uh, I think Sid was there. Mehdi wasn't, but Sid, you remember that day last summer we did an emergency Mbappe rejected us podcast. It was me, you, Jose, and Matt. To this day, that was the highest traffic podcast we've ever done and it was because a superstar rejected us and it wasn't because of like a champions league triumph (laughs) like it was crazy uh so you know those things like that are always eye-opening to me that like you know you know tactics aren't interesting to everybody um so you always have to like that's that's always a battle you're fighting yeah just adding my two cents to this like i just got a question this morning on the twitter feed like do you think we'll get Mbappe? What's your opinion? And it's like yeah. one question I've spent more time answering than any other for three years, probably in a row now, going back to 2020, honestly, I wrote about it in the article in 2020. So, and honestly, like I, it's impressive. And I, I relate because like when I was, I started being like a LeBron and Cleveland fan in 2016, but I wasn't a Cleveland fan. I was a LeBron fan. It, yeah. There's a big difference. And, um, as soon as he went to the Lakers, I unfollowed all the Cavs beat writers and followed all. Of <laughs> and I was just like, I don't care anymore about the Cavs. Like I was reading the Cavs writers. And I'm like, you all just sound salty. You lost LeBron. Like, <laughs> um, so I think that phenomenon is fascinating. It's um, like marketing is always interesting. It's the flashy big names that get people to pay attention to things first. And then obviously as their awareness evolves, they get into things like tactics, but I fully agree. And um that's why we've been a little clickbaity in some of our headlines, and we probably will talk about like you have to long. be, yeah, yeah. You have to be. You have to be. Like that's the thing. Like I, that's why I actually my view on clickbait is a little bit different. I think with the most conventional um, belief behind it, where people think it's evil, I think it to a certain extent it's necessary because like, I'll go back to the C trick um, stuff that C trick put out. If you call that tactical review. Um, it's just not going to get as many hits, but you have to like put a different spin on it. You have to, no matter how great your article is, it goes to waste if nobody clicks on it. So you have to bring people in somehow. So you have to have a little bit of clickbait in there and I'm okay with it. Uh, Obviously there are, there are lines that other publications will cross that I don't agree with, but I mean, generally speaking, you have to clickbait a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And so we're excited to have you on for the Mbappe episode next week. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sch- uh, sched- scheduled podcast every week. Yeah. The Mbappe. Uh, if yeah, four hour. Mondays at 5 p.m. Are you guys good? Yeah. If, we can do if, Holland on Fridays as well. Yeah. A four hour review on whatever happened and what can happen regarding Mbappe. Just a quick note on the point that Kian mentioned that Real Madrid obviously lose, lost a lot of following when Cristiano left. It's it's so funny to me how it happened with Barcelona because Barca didn't really lose anything when Messi left because not as you much. See, you see all these Barcelona accounts like all the all these Kule usernames. Everyone has a Messi World Cup or a Messi Ballon d'Or uh, 
profile picture. So that that didn't really happen with Real Madrid, Real Madrid. Like when Ronaldo went, some of the people just became Juventus fans forever, and then United fans forever, and then Al Nasser fans forever. But uh, Barcelona is like in, in lucky in that regard, as they are in a lot of the ways. Because I was just speaking with Sid offline about obviously the terrible injury that Gavi sustained uh, during the international break. Uh, the ACL is just the worst that can happen to a player. Uh, he's the eighth La Liga player, I think, who ruptured their ACL. And I was just talking to Sid, like, the other seven players combined didn't get as much attention as Gavi did. Barcelona's PR, I have all, like always said, I've never, like, felt... I've always felt like an envy towards it. I think it's impressive how they how they market their club. It's it's really impressive. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. on the note, just asking Kian, like, do you have any thoughts on this emotional, like, cult emotional feeling that Barcelona has created with Cruyff, Ajax, Messi, um, Argentina, maybe to some degree, not not to the same degree, <laughs> but like, what are your thoughts on like that? All the emotions that fuel that Real Madrid's PR and like. I think you're a big part of bringing Real Madrid's public relations forward. Like, there's a type of thought leader who reads about tactics in sports that only is interested in these things. And um, I feel like that fan originally was brought to Barcelona because of all the marketing around their triangles and their tiki-taka. I mean, their marketing got to the point where, like, there were conspiracy theories saying their passing networks are, like, maps telling drug traffickers how to, like, traffic drugs. (laughs) (laughs) That's propaganda, man. So any thoughts yeah. on the whole Real Madrid Barcelona dynamic propaganda marketing? I, I I think the Barca the Barca side of it, like all that PR with the cry stuff and the way they play football, I think it's pure delusion. I think they've been brainwashed to believe this in like in the most ridiculous way. And I love Diego, but he knows I would say this to his face too. I think it's they're purely deluded in this aspect of we have to play a certain way. And it's their way of coping with all of Real Madrid's titles, I think. It's their way of telling themselves, oh, it's okay. Let's pat ourselves on the back. It's not our fault. We're playing the right way. They're playing the evil way. I, I honestly think like if if Johan Cruyff had like said publicly, like, hey, guys, we're going to drink this Kool-Aid, mass suicide. I think they would all do it. They're that brainwashed in their philosophies of like, this is the way we must play. It's And this is the way how we play. If they played that way like once or twice in their entire history. If you go back and look at Johan Cruyff, the coach, when he was coaching Barca, it was disgusting football. Like th- this is, Eduardo Alvarez wrote about this. You can go back, watch it, the 1980 Copa del Rey final, I think it was, which they beat us. It was, they were in a low block they had like no possession. We were just hammering away, hammering away, trying to beat the low block, and they were kicking the shit out of us. That was what Johan Cruyff was like as a manager. And then years later, like it, there's a bit of a revisionist history with him and his philosophy and stuff. He had some ideas, but like Barca played that stereotypical way like a few times in their history, and it was contingent on generational talent being able to get them there. In any other era, when they don't have that kind of talent, they can't do that. Like they, tr- they tried to do that against teams that were better than them, and they got smoked. Whether it was Bayern, <laughs> who have been just destroying them for decades, or like you know, you look at all these Champions League eliminations. Whereas our philosophy has always been, we cater to our superstars, and we are not hell bent on playing one way. We're hell bent on winning. And that's always been the biggest difference. If Barcelona had that mentality, I'm kind of glad they don't because that's the reason why they're not as successful in Europe because they can't shape shift the way we do. They don't have the mentality that we do. They just want to play a certain way. And the problem is when you want to play a certain way and impose your will against teams that are better than you, you just can't do it. You're going to get smoked. And so. I'm kind of glad, but I, to me, it's just pure delusion and it's cope. It's their way of coping with not being as good as us in Europe. It's well, the, it's the story they tell themselves. Well, just a follow up question. It's not the fact that it's just them. It's the fact that Arsenal or Man City become Barcelona when they have a certain style or a certain coach. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. that's what I really like. I'm going to share my screen right now, actually. Um, yeah, go ahead. I got something really funny. <clears throat> um, like I saw this. Oh well, damn! I can't actually share my screen. Yeah, you can just send me the link. I can. I can oh, put it. I can. All right. So there's this really like 
funny um, comment here, but before you put it up, um, basically, I feel like when Man City got Guardiola, Barcelona fans started rooting for him. When Arsenal took Arteta from City and started playing like a very possession-based ball, they claimed him like one of theirs. Um, when mm. Bayern have been more physical, so they haven't been able to claim Bayern, thankfully. Um, <laughs> they never claimed Liverpool because Liverpool don't play that way. Uh, and I guess, like, I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on, like, how this these factions split? And Mehdi, if you want to share the screen now. Um, yeah, uh, did, you, uh, did you send it to me on the, on, the on Twitter? Yeah. Oh, on chat here? Yep. Um, sure. But, like, it feels like anytime there's a team playing possession football and the, the, whatever team is the closest to the Barcelona way in a given season, Barcelona roots for them and Barcelona. And they want them to beat Real Madrid because they want their ideology to win. And I've never seen anything like this in any sport in my honest life. I have never seen anything like this. Like, that is impressive that you get people to root for other clubs because you created this style and put your identity around it where you own it. Um, yeah. Like, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is fabricated, Sid. But I also think, like, I'm not saying it's completely fabricated, I guess. But I think the more accurate way of doing it is that there are principles that each manager has taken from different ideologies so Cruyff did inspire a lot Cruyff was also inspired by Renus Michaels Pep was inspired by Cruyff a lot of people were inspired by by Pep but there are there is it's not a singular ideology that they've copy and pasted there are just different elements that have take been taken from different chapters and I think uh like I'm, I'm curious to know what they'll claim with Chabi Alonso you know <laughs> I it's like, honestly speaking, like, you know, I remember Diego, this is way back when Ten Hag's stock was high, when he, what he was doing with Ajax that year, um, when they made that Champions League run, they eliminated Real Madrid. And people were asking, like, who would you bring uh, to Real Madrid? And I said, I'd love to see what Ten Hag would do with this young team. And, and Diego was like, no, he's... He would, it's impossible at Real Madrid. No, 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 he can't. They don't play that way. They don't play, they don't like his philosophy. I'm like, dude, this is, this is a different discussion that is completely irrelevant to what you're saying right now. <laughs> like, and, and like, it's like saying like, oh, we wouldn't hire Chabi Alonso because he plays a high octane, high pressing, dominant style of football. And I, and you wrote a great piece about it. So like it's in Chabi Alonso has the ability to deviate from that system if he needs to, like, it's not one all and be all, you know? This is, tweet is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the, this is, a lot of the Barca-Man City connection is very one-sided because Barcelona thinks like they're this sister club of theirs. Man City fans like don't give a yeah. shit about Barcelona. No. Because, they also like, screw Barca over by like making them <laughs> overpay for Ferran Torres. Like, they yeah, don't care. Yeah, stuff like that. And also... Like Lamine and all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and also like their Man City is just now a, a so much superior club than Barcelona right right now. But Barcelona fans like live in in that kind of delusion. And by the way, Kian is probably one of those people I wanted arrested in my Twitter account for wanting. <laughs> like I recently put out a tweet that whoever wants Ten Hag at Real Madrid should be arrested. <laughs> 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 well, I mean now, no, forget about it. Back <laughs> then, when his stock was high, it was different. That was a weird case. Even Barcelona fans don't want him anymore. Like that's a funny case. Um, and it's yeah. funny just because I tweeted this earlier. Like when they beat Xavi in February, like you couldn't tell how bad it was going to go for Ten Hag, and you still could see a future where he coaches a top team. Now, like man, he has a lot of work to do. Obviously, yeah. yeah. Um, Speaking of coaches, Kian, uh, that actually gives us a good segue into our next segment. You have obviously spoken with a lot of the top coaches from the press row: Tuchel, Pep, Carlo Ancelotti. Uh, which one of them have been the most uh, impressive to you overall, not just from the tactical aspect, the entire like aura, uh, as we spoke about the like, aura of the players. And also name few of the coaches that you would like to interview uh, from the press row that you haven't already. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think. So like from the top coaches, I think there's only been four that I've been able to talk to. Carlo, Pep, Klopp, and Tuchel. That's that's a pretty damn good list. <laughs> well, the the rest I'm trying to think. Emery, Marco Rose. Uh, 
I'm sure there's been more. Like there's been Spanish football coaches in La Liga that I've been able to talk to, but if I don't remember them, it means it probably wasn't that significant. Um, Solari was another one. Solari actually was really impressed with, um, but not because of necessarily his success or lack thereof at Real Madrid, but just the way he carried himself and he spoke. I'll tell you, the most impressive is always the people who enjoy talking about football. And as much as um, people might not like to hear, I actually really enjoy talking to Pep because if you ask him a question about football, he'll give you a very articulate and well-thought-out and lengthy response. Um, And he's like that with losses or wins. Tuchel, if I ask him a question after Chelsea win, he's going to give you a good response. If you ask him a question after a loss, he's going to give you a one-word response, like very, very, like not up for it. Uh, Carlo was, is generally amazing with all of his answers. He's, he's, he's great. Uh, and Klopp. Klopp is amazing too. Uh, and, I, and I'm quite jealous of the Premier League in this sense. That, like I think the journalists are luckier there because they have coaches like that that they can you know, ask questions with in press row. And I feel like in, in La Liga, it's a little bit more restricted, you know, we're not allowed to ask questions every game. You know, we're allowed to ask questions if it's a Champions League game or a U.S. preseason tour, sometimes in the Classico. But if if it's just, uh, you know, a, a regular league game, it's the seven predetermined uh, people who get to ask questions and it goes in order and it goes, you know, Marca, Cadena Serra, Cadena Copa, etc. Um so the access is just better in the Premier League, which is, you know, something I'm jealous of. I feel like we don't have that in La Liga as much. Yeah, what do you think of La Liga's overall marketing? Like, is it something that's disappointed you over the years? Because Real have really almost perfect marketing. Barca, as we established, have a cult of religious followers from the Church of Barcelona. And um, yeah, yeah. what do you think of La Liga's marketing overall? Do you think, like, I see a league that could be as almost as big as the Premier League if they made some tweaks, yeah. but often doesn't? What do you see? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's being carried by Real Madrid and Barcelona in large part. Obviously, Atletico has obviously done really well, too, in the last decade or so. Other than that, you know, it's not it's not that it doesn't have the PR machine that the Premier League has. I think you we, we've discussed it with you guys before. Like the Premier League just looks better for whatever reason yeah. on TV. The colors are brighter. Yeah. The commentators are are more engaging. I'm sorry. I actually really like the guys at La Liga TV, but they're kind of monotone a little bit in their in the way they, they present themselves. Um, ESPN, a little bit less monotone, but <laughs> they have their own things that we get frustrated about that they say. But There's no character and Richards and Andre like, doing it for La Liga. Yeah, and uh, we do have ex-players, but they're not, they're not, I guess, as charismatic in, in that sense or they're not, as fun. Spanish, maybe. They're not as much in English. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I guess people, some people will get Guti on the zone. Like, we don't have that. I guess maybe in Spain you do. I don't know. That seems like a cool, cool person to have post game or whatever. But uh, yeah, anyways, that's not even that's not even the main problem. I I think it's, I think, Sid, I'm curious to know what you think of this, but I feel like the path eventually is that what's going to fix this? It's going to be stars. You need stars in your league, right? So Real Madrid and Barcelona and sometimes Atletico are the ones who have the stars. It's between three teams. Sometimes even a really, really good La Liga team who doesn't have stars, no one's going to care about. Back when I was growing up, you know, Valencia had people like Mendieta and Aymar. Deportivo had people like Roy Mackay, Diego Tristan, Manuel Pablo, Mauro Silva. Um, you know, Real Sociedad had like Xabi Alonso. Mallorca had Samuel Atu for, for a brief time. Like they, the other teams had stars. That's not really the case anymore. But there is a path, and it's kind of like unfortunate, I guess, the way you'd have to go down to fix that. Almeria, for example, has a really rich owner. If he was allowed to spend and the salary cap rules were not as strict, he could turn Almeria into like a Newcastle if he wanted to. I just wonder if that's the path eventually. I don't know. I feel like it has to go down that route. Unless you really want to keep it strict and you're really worried about um, the sustainability of the spending, like you don't want to have another Malaga situation, 
I feel like that's the inevitable path that they're going to have to go down if they want to compete with Premier League. Yeah, or Super League forms and La Liga teams be cut out yeah. one or the other. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I don't know which way they go, only because um, I think La Liga is taking the stance that if all, the rest of football is unsustainable, we're not going to be like that, which I yeah. respect. But if they're wrong and the rest of football just keeps getting bailed out, if there's always going to be more money pouring in, if no club goes float, La Liga is just shooting themselves in the foot instead of taking on venture capital. Um, so, yeah, that that's how I see it. And truth be told, it could go either way. There could be a world where Man City, Chelsea get relegated. Premier League gets outed for some huge financial fraud, maybe. But I really <laughs> don't expect that to happen. Let's be honest. Yeah. It's going to get bigger every year. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we need our own Newcastle as soon as possible, for sure. It's it's also, I think, the language and culture barrier does play a part. Because, obviously, Kian and Diego hosted Andrea Orlandi uh, a couple of weeks back. It was a fantastic podcast. And there are more people like Orlandi who probably have the same kind of knowledge, same kind of awe about them, but they just don't speak uh, English as as fantastically as Andrea Orlandi does. So probably to bring them into the broadcast world is a bit difficult. Not difficult in the, in the Spanish universe, obviously, but to cater to the English-speaking audience, it's a little bit difficult. I think that that is a barrier that people will have to figure out how they get, get past that. Yeah. Uh, Orlandi is great, and but I, I think also, like, it's kind of hard to find the people who are also entertaining inter- mm-hmm. and also smart. Like, I know that people, like, get annoyed with people like Michael Richards, for example. I think he's fantastic. I just think he's entertaining. Like, yeah. it's the same reason, like, the, in my opinion, the greatest media team in all of sports is the TNT crew with Shaq and Charles Barkley and Kenny and uh, Chuck. Chuck, no, the um, the the sm- what the moderator guy. Yeah, the fourth guy. I don't remember his name right now, but yeah. Come on, man. We can't. We cannot. Uh, right, right, I know his name. What? I, um, this is driving me nuts. Ernie Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. I think. And, and like, look, the analysis is not always great, but man, it's so fun to watch them talk. <laughs> and it's so fun to see the banter. It's so fun to to see Charles Barkley fall into the trap of getting himself in that's what she said jokes and Shaq trying not to laugh in the corner. Like that's a really entertaining crew. I don't feel like we the closest thing we have to that in football is the Thierry Henry, Jamie Carragher, Michael Richards thing. I, I Like we don't really have people like that who can... Who can make it really entertaining? Yeah, I thought yeah. Chiringuito at points almost got there, and then it kind of fell apart. Yeah, like, they're also crazy. unethical. My most favorite Twitter account in all of the universe was El Chiringuito in English. Mm. How how they would put the subtitles in like a very poker face manner. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. It was it was just just too good. Uh, I have a question for Kian. That's so. We know that some of the media narratives, at least in Spain, are controlled by or driven by the clubs. At least we know that as a rumor that Madrid controls Marca, AS, and uh, Barcelona controls Depo- Mundo Deportivo, Sport, those kind of uh, publications. You've obviously worked with Spanish colleagues, you have friends there in the media. How much it? How much of it is actually what it seems like? Is are the clubs actually driving that much narratives, or it's much lower level at a much lower level than what we actually think? No, I think they do. Um, I want something that was eye opening to me was this past summer because, like, I I've learned a lot, and I like it. What look. I think it's also true that like we don't really have like a Woj Narowski or or I mean Fabrizio is the closest one to that. And he's not um, Woj, he's more of a personality now, right? Yeah, exactly. Um so I don't think there's like this one like in basketball I feel like there are a group of people like if they say something it's pretty accurate. Like yeah, it's a pretty good chance, right? There's 10 people who run the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I don't think we have 10 people in football like that. Um, 
not for like one league anyway. Maybe if you put all the leagues together, you could put together 10 people, but still not to that level of like 100% accuracy, basically. Yeah. Uh, so like for the longest time, it was like you really basically just turn a blind eye to like 80% of the stuff that's being written in the Spanish press and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But I also do know that, you know, there's the one guy at Marco in particular who gets spoon fed and writes whether it's true or not. It's basically just mouthpiece. Like this is what you're writing today. Something that was eye opening to me in the U S was that one person, one of the media members showed me, we were talking about Mbappe, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and this person showed me their WhatsApp with Florentino. Wow. And they were like, okay, well, let's see what Florentino said. Uh, yeah, we are not there. Ha- we have never contacted Mbappe this summer. We're not going to, uh, if he, if he like shows interest and contacts us, we'll we'll explore it. But this is why I don't think Mbappe is coming. Like they they showed me the Florentino WhatsApp, and I was like, oh shit! And I was like, so so, how many people have access to Florentino like that? And this person told me about five, uh, and they listed the five to me. And I was like, okay. So I kind of just made a mental note. I was like, okay. So I'll I guess I'll 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 take these five seriously. And the rest not as seriously, and I was like eye opening to me like okay like there is obviously some kind of correspondence going to certain people from Florentino himself, um, but for the most part like I started to sift through and I can tell you guys off air I don't know I don't I don't want to lose anyone's I trust. Say, I was gonna say I'm gonna guess the names and we're gonna find out off air. But <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you off air, but I don't want to like lose the trust of this person telling course, me to like to say anything else yeah. publicly, but like. I started to like know like okay so I I read this from this paper like obviously I'm not going to take it too seriously now so at the very least I started to take things more seriously with certain media outlets um but I don't know I guess my this is kind of unrelated I think I would love to see a, a universe where it shifts the media power shifts a little bit for selfish reasons admittedly but um it's very controlled by like a few Spanish media who could be doing a better job with the way they report things and the way they analyze the game. And I I would love to see a shift in power where Real Madrid kind of makes, caters to more global media and not just Spanish. Because the majority of Real Madrid fans are actually outside of Spain. And I think the club sometimes doesn't remember that. Like, you know, with the way they prioritize which media they give access to, and a lot of these media have actually also turned their back on the club and went at them and and it doesn't seem to have stifled the relationship as much, you know. I remember like there was the one guy, this one drove me nuts the most. Remember when Zidane was there? And I think I will take this to my grave. Every, like Zidane's open letter talking about like, you know, his what what he didn't like the club would do behind his back in the media and like the fact that everyone said he was tired and all this, all these different things. I'll take this to my grave. I think Zidane left because this this one guy in the media, every single press conference, he would ask Zidane the same question. And it was either about like, basically like paraphrasing, but it was like either about James or Bale. Like, why don't you like play these guys? Why do you hate them? Like I saw that. And Zidane's <laughs> question answer was like one word. He hated this guy so much. And you probably know who I'm talking about, Mahedi, because you, because like a couple years later, this same journalist approached Zidane on the c- street with a camera and a mic, and Zidane. Oh, I see. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Zidane I, I knew was we were like, about. "Dude, you, I'm not on the clock anymore. Like, get the fuck away from me. Like, I don't like you." And he, he should have like taken the microphone like Ronaldo did and like throw it into the river or something. Like, I would not have blamed him if he did that. And like, and still without clockwork. Like like clockwork, the club would prioritize this guy who Zidane himself hated. They would prioritize this guy to ask questions instead of some other guys who would actually ask some useful questions about football. And I remember speaking to one of the Real Madrid PR guys about this. I was like, dude, like you know we are not going to ask this stupid question. And you know that we are not going to piss off our dear coach like this. So why why is it like this? And he said, I know I agree with you, but it's predetermined and it's politics and it's out of our control like it's premeditated who gets to ask questions and it's basically this way and it has to be this way and so i would like to see a shift in the media power in the future where we start to reward people 
who are trying to approach us with a little bit more dignity. Yeah, it's weird because we, our branding is so modern in like 80, 90 percent of aspects, like the colors, mm. the players, the the way we market the players to other <clears throat> global audiences. But the that one aspect is definitely something missing, I think. Generally, and something over the last five years since Ronaldo left, I think there's been so many, so much uncertainty over what's going on in the higher offices. Um, and, you know, what you said about Zidane, that's very illuminating. I didn't realize that, like, they let one dude keep asking the same questions. And I just looked him up. Not too hard to find out who it is. Um, yeah. That's crazy. Well, and, it, and it wasn't about him. It was about who we worked for. And that's the, they have to prioritize that Spanish media outlet, basically. Because the people, because there's like family ties and politics connections between Barcelona, Real Madrid, Rubiales, media, all these people, essentially, like it's one big family. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, I don't know the specifics of like how it originated and, you know, what the connections are exactly. Just that it's been always this way. And that's why that's the answer. Like it's always been this way. And so. Yeah, and it, it also uh, comes to the point, I think recently one of our uh, Managing Madrid Patreons asked a question that. If Zidane and Ancelotti had the same work environment, quote unquote, they clearly did not. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the other things, Kian, regarding like uh, these kind of politics, is this just? It, it can just be like Madrid-based, right? This must be like going around in other parts of Spain as well. Uh, I mean, I don't really know details in, in that sense, but like you know, Barcelona have the same thing in the Catalan media, I assume. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with, um, it's funny, like if you, like the Basque teams, like if Athletic come to the Bernabeu, for example, the press conference after the game, all the questions will be in Basque um, and the answers will be in Basque. And so like, I think each team probably has that um, to a certain extent. Whereas like maybe the smaller teams, they will take questions from anyone because their coach doesn't even get questions. Sometimes it's actually sad. Like the oh. coach will come there. No one cares to ask them a question. So they'll, anyone who raises their hand, like even some guy off the street, like, yeah, come ask our coach a question. They don't get like any questions. I feel bad for them. But like, yeah, I think that that exists for like almost any big club to a certain degree where like they have their own politics with certain media outlets or whatever. And it has become a little bit bland, I think, because... I I only like found this clip recently. Uh, it was during the Mourinho. I think it was during Mourinho's last season. I wasn't. On, I I don't think I was on on Twitter even, and I was obviously not watching Real Madrid press conferences at that time. I'm pretty sure both of you guys know uh, know the about this it, thing that happened where Mourinho sent Aitor Karanka uh, for a press conference. And when he announced that Mourinho is not going to be here, all the journalists just stood up and left. And Madrid won the game 2-0. Mourinho came to the press conference. Someone from uh, Ask.com asked him a question. And Mourinho's reply was, tell the owner of or the director of Ask to come and ask me the question because I sent my employee. You didn't ask him a single question. I'm not going to answer to ask us employee now send your director or owner so That's that great. was that was jose Mourinho at his revening best that that was pure cinema i'm like <laughs> i'm like the the memes that would have been made out of that if if twitter was around the way it is right now and it is it is one of my most favorite Mourinho clips of all time like how he says that and he was like he was in the mood he was wearing a black shirt a black suit he was like looking like a gangster and Madrid won that game uh, it was I think was a kind of a difficult game we won that 2-0 and that was just fantastic I think it's it's also funny to see how the media will treat you based on how they perceive they're being treated and that's, I think there's a lack of objectivity there. Like, think about, because Carlo Ancelotti is a very approachable guy. And he responds with each question with, you know, a general level of, of I guess, interest or, for lack of a better word, of, like, insight or whatever. Zidane was very short with the media. Mourinho, obviously, was very polarizing because he loved poking, you know, poking the fire stick and, and getting people angry. You look at how the media treated Mourinho and Zidane versus the way they treat Ancelotti, for example, the way they write about them, which is completely different because like, they feel like Ancelotti is like the nice guy who gives them good insight, whereas Zidane just wanted to get out of there as soon as the press conference started and Mourinho was just 
hilarious. I mean, right? You know, he he liked to stir the pot, and so the media also like well, it, how they will write about you is dictated with how they perceive they're being treated. On Mourinho, do you feel like um? I mean, I guess you were a fan then, not as much first seat access as you have now. But um, like, do you feel like something changed in his time at Real? Like the lights got too bright at some point um, for him? Or do you think he tried poking the bear or poking the media bear in a completely new environment that he had not expected in stakes that he wasn't expecting? Like, what do you think of those years in terms of the toll? Because Guardiola has openly said, like, he couldn't handle the media pressure and he just couldn't handle how the club made him deal with it. So he left. Um, and looking back, I wonder if that was some of the problem for Mourinho. Yeah, I mean, I think the Guardiola aspect too is interesting, even though it's not directly related, because there's a great book by Paolo Kondo, Italian football journalist, who, who followed Pep and Mourinho around during that peak classical era, those three years. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot in there about Pep was... Pep was literally drained from the psychological warfare with Mourinho. Like he, he was sick of it. He couldn't handle it. Like it affected his mental health. He hated the fact that he had to like think of like something to say in response to Mourinho every time, and he didn't know what to say. In this room, you're the king. <laughs> yeah, like this thing. Like uh, it really affected him, um, and it actually affected the Barcelona players too because they felt. Oftentimes, they that more that Pep didn't really win that battle in the press, the psychological battle. And I remember one time, and because he wouldn't respond, like that was Pep's thing. And then eventually, Pep broke one time and did respond to Mourinho. It's all in the book. And after the press conference, all the Barcelona players, like Xavi and Yesa, they're applauding Pep for finally speaking up and, and standing his ground. And that, <laughs> that, that Pep was like, "That's not my style." Like that, he, it was really draining for him. But with regards to the Mourinho, I don't know if it's necessarily about the press aspect of it, but uh, I think it was a matter of, like, Eduardo Alvarez puts this really well when he says Mourinho, when he first brought him, was a necessary evil. All of his antics, all of the things that he brought with it and all the distractions were completely necessary to band together against that Barca team. Um, And I think by the end of it, it probably just went too far. And I think the players themselves felt a little bit mm-hmm. uh, disunited under his leadership. And I think it, it just, it was a three-year cycle. And by the way, like I remember being there as a fan, just all of us do on, on this podcast, right? I My personal feeling at the time was like, I don't want him to go. I, I feel like it's a mistake to let him go because even though that last year wasn't great, I think it would, you know, you're starting from scratch without him again. Uh, His legacy when he left was still like best coach in football history. When he left at that moment, like Guardiola was trying to rival him and arguably going to eclipse him, but he was right there with anyone. He had won trophies everywhere. So I I was there like 12, 13 was my first season. And I was stoked to hear we had this legendary coach. And then when I heard about the fallout with the players, I was confused because it was such a novel thing at that time for Jose Mourinho to not be, completely successful yeah, yeah we have to think about the, no, the on, aspect on, of like sorry Mahidi, just the aspect of like a lot of the um a lot of the kind of turning points with Mourinho yeah. Realm, just some of that was stemmed with Casillas and the fact that Mourinho felt that he was a rat in the locker room uh he has that thing where he comes in Jersey Dudek has a has a, something in his book about where Jersey Dudek, who I always forget is a Real Madrid player, was a Real Madrid player. Uh, but he was in the locker room one day and he writes his, writes about it in, this, in his book where Mourinho comes in and he freaks out at everyone about the rat in the locker room. He starts pointing a finger at like a bunch of people in the locker room and he says, was it you, Granero? Was it you? And like he points to everyone in the locker room and it just, like that was like a bit of a starting point of this, the vibes are just not great anymore. Like it's yeah. it, that brotherhood that existed. Um, there was just a chaos that ensued with with Mourinho there by the end of it, and the team just wasn't as bought in, and the brotherhood was lost. And I think you know, the, also the falling out with Pepe, you know, who obviously was mm-hmm. one of the the leaders in the locker room. That that wasn't great because he lost Casillas. Um. 
So and then after that, it went from like Mourinho and Real Madrid versus the world versus like Mourinho versus everyone. And I think that's kind of when everything just kind of degenerated. Yeah, I just think it's um interesting how like I'm surprised we finished the 2012 season so strong when you read when like some of those spats happened between yeah. Mourinho and the players. Like they started happening in 2011. Like they found it weird in 2011. 2011, 12, we lost the first league Clasico after building a lead. We lost the Copa del Rey to them in January. And when we lost the first leg, I believe that's when Mourinho was angry about a snake and Ramos and Casillas were like pissed that they went and set up in a block against Barcelona with hundreds of millions in talent. And um, which I think that is what fascinates me the most. It's the fact that like that was the last time Mourinho's tactics worked. And it was definitely a weird style that we played with the amount of talent we had. And I can see why it was hard to convince Ramos mm. Ronaldo, like, yo, be humble, like defend, like don't don't go and take the game to these guys. They're way too good technically. And uh, but that, and it's impressive that they closed out and won the league on 100 points, beat Barcelona, the new camp, after that incident, I think. It's pretty crazy, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think Mourinho... that's... Go ahead. Oh, go, ahead, go, 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 ahead. Ahead. go ahead. No, I'll quickly say just like, I think that's the impressive thing is like everyone talks about Barca, that Barca team being the greatest team of all time. And man, you know, for being the greatest team of all time, you know, they lost league titles to us in that, in that era. Uh, you know, we were breaking records. And I'm not, I'm not going to necessarily dispute it because I think that Barca team was amazing. But I think that it was impressive that Mourinho came in. And you think about even after the 2009 summer that we had, bringing all those superstars, you know, it wasn't until Mourinho came that we, we, we took it to another level. And just to what you said, Sid, about the frustration of playing that low block, you remember that scene, that clip, I'm sure that, you guys have seen where Ronaldo is pressing Barca by himself in the Bernabeu yeah. <laughs> and he just throws his hands in the air. And he's just so frustrated. Like, definitely, man, that affects you when you're a player as good as Ronaldo and that's what you're doing all game is chasing shadows. It's got to be frustrating. Yeah. Mourinho was the guy that I felt the most, you know, connected to as a Real Madrid fan as like, I'm going to go to war for this guy, even as a fan. I'm like, with all the great coaches that we had over the years, even including Zidane and Carlo, I don't think I've ever felt as strong as about someone as I did for Mourinho. So he he had that theatrics about him. Also, the incident where like he came to uh, came to the dugout forty minutes earlier so that the crowd boos him for forty minutes and then that doesn't boo the uh, boo the team. I think it was before a Madrid derby or something. So Mourinho had those moments where he would do something so preposterous, so dramatic. Uh, People will automatically give him that attention. So that that was that was just great about him. Um, yeah. A couple of penultimate questions before any of you have, Mahdi. I yeah. just wanted to ask: low, worst moment as a Real Madrid fan and best moment. First, with start with worst though. Uh, worst <clears throat> three come to mind. Uh, I was at that four-one loss against Ajax. And it was a nightmare. It was horrible to sit through. It felt like I've never been to Amsterdam, but I imagine I felt like that's what Amsterdam is. Like it was just Ajax fans everywhere in the stadium, in the streets, singing and partying. Yeah. Uh, and it was just a t- tough loss to sit through. Uh, the Luis Figo penalty miss in 2003 against Juve, my heart was broken. I thought that we could have uh, beat Milan in the final or at least reached that final and had a historic game against Milan. Uh, and the th- Third one is I'm um, probably this is actually number one is the penalty shootout versus Byron in 2012, which was still by far the most heartbreaking moment of my life. Yeah, that those all make sense. Then what's the yeah. best? Do you guys have many outside that list? Um, mine was 4-0 against Barcelona in 2015 November because like I started mm. after the penalty like penalty shootout i knew what was going on but i wasn't like the day-to-day invested person i was the following season and so yeah, yeah we talked about it on our first episode mine was 20 the 4-0 against barcelona was under benitez was by far the worst yeah 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 for me like as we spoke about this in the first episode as well uh, the 4-0 against liverpool in 2008 mm. was was yep. brutal the 5-0 against barcelona affected me a, a lot because I was finally thinking, okay, Mourinho is here. Because I've been following Mourinho even during his Chelsea days as well. 
So I was like, okay, finally the Barcelona curse is over. Mourinho is not going to let us lose this badly against Barcelona. And first Clasico, we get thrashed by 5-0. Mm. Pre- unknown players from Barcelona score against us. That was pretty bad. And also the one you mentioned, the penalty shootout against Bayern was brutal. But the loss against Dortmund, where Ramos and Casillas cry... Uh, in 2013, where one more goal would have taken us to the final, Mourinho's last season, that was pretty, pretty, pretty brutal too. Mm, yeah, those are all great shouts uh, and terrible to think about again. Uh, best moments, I'd go. I mean, I I don't know what the specific moment is, like anything that happened in 2002, 22 Champions League run. Yeah, but I guess specifically, probably Rodrigo's second goal was the peak of like I don't know outer body experience. Um, the Ramos's header is number one, ninety two forty eight. And if I had to choose one more, I don't know. I remember. I mean, there's been a lot, but I maybe one that's underrated because the trophy wasn't as big. But the Cristiano's header in the Copa del Rey final against Barca was an incredible moment. No, we needed that one. We couldn't, like, yeah. we had to win one of those four in the 17 days. I'm glad we got yeah. that one. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's interesting how people of different cultures just briefly have all, like, you're going through your life randomly, like, you have your day-to-day stresses, but then this Real Madrid 2022 happens or that Ramos happens and we're all brought together by these random moments. I find that fascinating. Yes, someone who's tried disowning my fandom and has come back to it since 2022 i find that fascinating um, yeah so. yeah <laughs> what about you yeah. guys was there any others uh for me like number one is obviously 90 to 48 there's there's no questions about it i actually like uh in my room that i used to live in toronto i now right now i'm in hamilton but in Toronto, in my room, I didn't have a clock, and I like bought the numbers carved in wood nine two four eight, and I had that fit in my wall. That this is the only timestamp that's gonna be on my wall. <laughs> no clock in this room. <laughs> so yeah. ninety two ninety two forty eight was was pretty big. Uh, apart from that, yeah, a lot of the moments from last like the last Champions League that we won, but even better than Man City was I think Benzema's third goal versus PSG. Mm. That was just like that was yeah. that felt personal that we are screwing over PSG like that and they can do anything about it. But one thing about being a Real Madrid fan is sometimes in some of the games, at at a certain point you know that Real Madrid's not gonna lose this game. Like when they scored the second when Casemiro scored in Cardiff, you 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 kind of knew like no team's gonna beat this team now. When yeah. Bell scored in Lisbon. You kind of knew that there is absolutely no team that's equalizing from here. So I think that's something exclusive to Real Madrid fans. We kind of know that when our team gets into that groove, it probably is more rare than it was a few years back. But when they get into that groove, we kind of know that, okay, it's going to be still toiling and everything, but we're not going to lose this. So yeah. that there's an invisible really like there's an invisible momentum shift that happens where like the other team starts getting paralyzed. And uh, I think Mikel Marino described it really well last season. He's like something happens in the Bernabeu when you're playing there as an opposing team. When they score, you can just feel it like it's you can't describe it, but the fans start getting into it and everything just changes. And, you know, the PSG th- turning point the city turning point Benzema third goal was a great shout I mean even when Ramos scored against Atletico in 92 48 it didn't feel like an equalizer it felt like a game winner even though it was a mere equalizer like you look at Atletico's (laughs) bench I think it's Gabby who is holding his no it's Christian Rodriguez it's Christian Rodriguez. is it he's like holding his face in tears basically like he's like (laughs) we knew because they were gas at that point yeah, they they spent bad. the entire game trying to like hold the lead and defend. They kind of knew it was over, basically, heading into extra time. Uh, I'll just give a couple more. I agree with you about Bales. I mean, the bicycle kick in Lisbon was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I, I you know, I celebrated that one like crazy. The other one was um, Zidane's volley in Glasgow. I mean, I was lucky enough to to watch that live and be a fan at that point. And that, to me, was I was 13 at that time. 
and I was watching that losing my shit and I was like I've this is this is proof that God exists and this is like it really was at that point the craziest thing I've ever seen a footballer do like the way he struck it in a, like really really like in terms of deifying a, a human like that was pretty much the peak to me I was like this guy's the goat this guy's <laughs> unreal worth every penny I, w- I remember like so the two the two Champions League goals in the finals Zidane and Bale have to be up there I think in terms of greatest moments yeah. again like being a Real Madrid fan you see Kian did probably didn't even realize he said les- uh, bicycle kick in Lisbon although it was in Kiev but Kiev, the, thing, right, yeah, but the Kiev. thing is Bale has won so many Champions League titles and he has scored so many yeah. Champions League final goals <laughs> it's easy to mix things up that's that's the perk of being a real yeah Madrid Kiev fan, Lisbon they're all the same Cardiff, yeah. Cardiff <laughs> yeah. Milan, Milan. Yeah. Glasgow yeah, Paris. Paris. Paris twice yeah Oh, right. Um, so I guess what's interesting um, about like all those moments is, yeah, they're all Champions Leagues. And, I, uh, you know, it's hard to pick between so many cool moments. It's cool. Like you have to mention 9248 and 2022 together. Like they're almost inseparable because of how cool they are. Um, yeah, I, I think 2022 is number one because like I literally was like on the verge of stopping, as I've told you. And I mentioned this before, but a little more detail, like I'm going to stop. And then I see in October, there's the Managing Madrid podcast in L.A. And like that was a lot of fun. And just that that team of all the teams for that team to go win and for all the Man City and Liverpool analytics of fans, like all the expected goals, like spreadsheet followers, man, they got melt it. down. <laughs> they melted down. They couldn't comprehend. Yeah. And I look, I had a big conversation with Ryan Whalen about this because you know, yes. I mean, he he's a big believer in like the the probably the statistically speaking, the best way to play football is whatever increases your chance mathematically to win and that based on years of evidence is to generate the most chances right yeah and so and i told him like look dude there has to be a sequel to your book we have to talk about there's something else happening here from a mental psychological standpoint that can't be measured it's like in these moments these teams are shitting the bed while another team is just like getting stronger and you, like how do we measure this like bare that book was barely he barely mentioned real Madrid because it just and and i think it like a lot of people like that they just couldn't comprehend it and it drove them nuts but it's funny if you look at i don't know if this is common knowledge but if you look at the overall xg from the city city game i don't know if it was just the second leg i think real Madrid's xg was actually higher in the second leg overall yeah yeah we yeah we- What's weird about the, that whole run is like there were very lucky moments, and then there was the evolution tactically where we actually like shut down City in the second leg. We actually yeah. like prevented Liverpool from getting match outside that Salah chance. I honestly felt like Liverpool created nothing in the final. Um, and so yeah, that was an underrated story. I think Ryan's a funny case too because like I met him at that live call. Pod, and yeah, I haven't changed too many words with him, but I swear he didn't come across as like as XG like centric. Like he was. From what I remember, we were making fun of Man City's defenders when we met at the thing, like for being soft, you know, like Zinchenko and Cancelo. So that's what I, maybe I'm misremembering, but when I no. when I checked, we were making fun of Man City's defenders, not just, um, like because. Well, he is a Liverpool fan as well, so. <laughs> yeah, so Liverpool get the low end of that stick. Oh. Everyone, like, analytically, Man City's better is what they're always trying to say. So yeah, um, yeah, that that whole dynamic, but just honestly, every round, like seeing people lose their minds, but also getting more stressed because, like, once you got past Chelsea, you had to win it. Like, once you get close to beating City, you just have to beat them or it's going to be disappointing. And um, those moments were just unreal. Um, how was the traffic on on managing Madrid during that time? Like, did that kind of change us as a club, our perception? Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, we, we were milking it that whole run, uh, especially because we were doing Zoom calls after each of those comebacks. And so it would always get maxed out, like, because our Zoom limit right now was 100. Uh, so we would always tell patrons, like, hey, you probably just want to get in ASAP because if you can't get in, we can't let you in. It's, it'll be 100, 100 people is the max we can let in. And it would always get maxed out. But we would get so many hits. And then from there, so many new patrons who wanted to hear our post-game thoughts because we were doing it behind the, the membership. It was great. I mean, from a traffic standpoint, it was great. And again, like 
we're lucky in the sense that Real Madrid has gone so deep in the Champions League for so long. It's been great for our careers as well. It's been what, like, how many, 13 Champions League semifinals in the last 15 years, something crazy like that, Something, right? something like that, yeah. It's insane, the consistency, man. And um, I wanted to say something about what you said earlier. I don't know if it was XG related. Yeah, just as like, so like, <clears throat> I'm curious to know what your thoughts on this are. So when you look at the fact that Real Madrid's XG was higher in that second leg versus Manchester City, where everyone says City dominated and Real Madrid got lucky. If Real Madrid's XG was higher, what it, it, it meant really what it, what it meant was they did all of their damage in a short time span. In that short time span, they were more dominant than City were in the first like 75% of the game. But somehow, like we're we're told that like that means they didn't deserve to win. But I look at it a different way. It's very similar, like Muhammad Ali, what would he do with all of his experience? He would just absorb, 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 and then Towards the end, he will just unleash carnage. That's what yeah. we were doing. And like, no one goes back and says Muhammad Ali was dominated for 75%. He didn't deserve to win. Like, no, that's Muhammad Ali, the GOAT. Like, he had, there was a method to the madness. Um, I'm not, yeah, and I'm not saying like it's like the perfect way to play football. I would rather, you know, we don't dig ourselves a hole. We're always frustrated the way Real Madrid have their first halves, right? But like, I feel like the amount of discredit was insane. But man, I gotta say, like, especially from the athletic, I thought yeah. some of their stuff was ridiculous. Like, <laughs> yeah, I didn't read, but I mean, like the, the the PK stuff recently, like, is twice now in the past week. No one will remember. No one will remember. Like, dude, no one has remembered as much as you. And like the fact that he keeps bringing it up is just, it's just the the meltdown across the earth uh, from this, and constantly being reminded about it, how lucky we were, is just so delicious, man. To those tears are so delicious, and it's because Barca's fans were supporting City that year too. That's yeah. Also yeah. yeah, We beat yeah. Barcelona, and Manchester, not just Manchester City. Yeah, 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 for the, sure. The people who decided to have Sergio Ramos give the award to Shakira, I mean, oh. that is a PR oh. masterclass. That is the best of. That is the goat <laughs> of marketing. <laughs> That's one of the most underrated things that happened in football this year. Yeah, and one more thing, like if if Ryan ever writes a sequel. Of his book, it should be called Power of Friendship. And it's and the cover <laughs> should be and the cover should be Ancelotti having some fun smoking a cigar with Vinicius Militao and like dancing with Kamavinga Rodrigo Vinicius. <laughs> that has well, to be what the book's called. Well, on the topic of finishing, I think it's even Ryan has said this, and I don't know how many people talk about it. I did a long form post that got no traction because people don't like nerdy content. But um basically <laughs> The reason expected goals works is because in football, there's a shared level of genetic, biological, and social constraints that shape the environment. So players are getting up at certain times, they're eating certain foods, they're working out in certain ways. They're all consuming pretty homogenized content. Like there isn't as much diversity in terms of like how you think anymore it might be a thing. And so expected goals yeah. is the result of that. It means that yeah. when you measure it in one league, then you get a like I'm pretty sure Premier League expected goals in La Liga aren't the exact same weights. They have slightly different weights. Season by season, you might get slightly different weights to the models. I'm not sure if that's how it works, but um definitely you get different weights league to league, and it doesn't work at youth level to the same degree. Like you can measure shots, mm. but there's so much more fluctuation in finishing quality. And Ryan said at some point, like, we just need to figure out how to quantify finishing. And I think what would be more helpful is also quantifying like last ditch defending a little better, uh, desperate mm -hmm. defending. But those things are just not known, which is why it's not common, which is why like Real Madrid will win and fan, like analy some analysts who are behind the curve or still stuck on contemporary paradigms will say, hey, they didn't finish. But like if you're ahead of the curve, you have a metric saying, hey, like Bale can hit bicycle kicks better than everyone mm -hmm. else on earth. So you should buy him and you'll win no matter what XG says. Like there are things like that out there um, that I think will become more common. And I think that season was big for me on a personal level because it helped me see through the bias of XG. I think I became one of those XG people at one point where I started following the game through spreadsheets. So that thrill of seeing the game transcend the spreadsheet, I think was just essential to the sport. Um, 
Yeah. And I hope we Correct. see something like that again. Like, I, I would love to see, like, a season where Barcelona, Man City, and Bayern have, like, the best expected goals in the history of European football, and they lose one by one to us. That would be crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think there's one thing, Sid, like, that is going to be... As of now, we don't have a way to measure it. Maybe in the future that'll change. Is that the timing of certain events in a football match really matter in terms of the psychological blow that it deals? For example, when we scored the second goal against PSG and almost immediately after scored the third, it was like, you can't measure, like the timing of that was an absolute like hammer blow for PSG. And then there's moments like when Luka Modric slide tackles Lionel Messi with like perfection in that run. And it was just like, there's like a collective like disbelief that was happening to PSG in that moment. Like the separation between the two psychological states of both teams going in opposite directions and the timing of how everything was happening it's those things right now are just really hard to measure. I think, I don't, I don't know what it is yeah. in basketball. At least I think we have some kind of way of, of measuring clutch. Like we have like how players perform in the last four minutes of each game. It's harder to do that in football, but I think there is something happening on a psychological level that is the analytics. People just had a really hard time to grapple with during that run. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, so guys, we're almost at time, but before we close this one out, uh, I do have a couple of more questions for Kian. One being, just pivoting back to managing Madrid, uh, what are some of the future visions or future goals that you currently even tentatively have for managing Madrid? We don't obviously have to get into specifics, but just a brief idea about what are some of the goals or visions that you're having for the website right now. And also, what are some of the words you would want to have for people who are trying to make it into the industry? Uh, what should be some of the core values or core principles they should stick by no matter what? Because like some of the things, you do something that you have to do every day, but you do it still because you really enjoy it. This is something you're passionate about. How difficult it is to adhere to that passion every day you wake up, probably something along those lines. Yeah, so the managing Madrid thing, uh, I would say there's three goals. One is we want to have a studio in Madrid where we can record our podcast, probably seat enough people to join in live for like if there's members in town in Madrid that mm -hmm. day, maybe they can stop by the podcast and sit in and listen to it. Uh, a revolving door where journalists come and do work, hang out, you know, mm -hmm. play some ping pong, play FIFA, record podcasts and kind of like brainstorm off of each other. The second thing is uh, we want to get more inside access in terms of getting players on the podcast, even mm -hmm. ex-players. That's only happened a couple times, I think, in the podcast history. Um, and the third thing is we're going to just kind of diversify the contact, con uh, content. So I don't know if people remember that last year before Classico, I went outside of the Bernabeu and I interviewed fans. Uh, I'm going to be doing that more regularly just to kind of provide some a different kind of content. So I'm going to be doing that for the Napoli game at the end of this month. So more of that stuff probably. Um, and with regards to the second question about people trying to break through, I would say it's more difficult than ever, but also easier than ever. So it's going to be more difficult than ever, I think, to break through like media outlets like The Athletic or The Guardian or ESPN, these traditional outlets, because I think a lot of these guys are kind of grandfathered in and they've been there for a while. But it's never been easier to create content and gain a following. So you're very lucky in that sense. So I think you have to be open-minded in what works and put your biases aside. So for example, I hated having to do TikTok shorts because it takes my words out of context and it's a hassle to cut out clips, but you have to do it because it's a way to get people in the funnel and grow a following. So be diligent about that stuff in, in marketing yourself. Understand sales. I think if you go the route of content creation, it would be useful to be either get in the sales course or just learn how, to, how marketing funnels work because that's really important. And the second thing is 
be consistent and be okay and start to love the menial tasks. So for example, it's not hard. It's not easy, sorry, to edit podcasts and upload them. It's one thing to like get the podcast recording done, but it's another thing behind the scenes that happens that no one sees to actually get the content out. Mm -hmm. And it might be fine the first couple times you do it, but you have to do that like three, four, five times a week. That shit can get really boring and hard to sustain. So you have to somehow grow to love it. Like for me, it's been, I put on headphones and listen to audiobooks or listen to like the new, new album and just kind of get into a flow state so I can enjoy that process a little bit more. If you don't learn to enjoy that stuff, I think you're toast pretty soon. Yeah, I'm working um, on it. Eddie's carrying so far on Real Deal, just letting you all know. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that stuff is like, it's hard to sustain that stuff. So you got to be really consistent. And the difference is like, I've seen so many rounded podcasts come and go, man. And it, the, I think one thing that's kept us going is that we've been pretty psychotic about like, you know, every day basically for like seven, eight years now. And I think if you can't learn how to love that stuff, it's going to be hard to sustain. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's facts. All right. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Thanks so much, Kian, for being with us. It's like, uh, it's been a very, very lovely discussion. We talked about so many things and we hope that in whenever you have time, we get to do this again on the Real Deal pod. Uh, for the fans who enjoyed this in video or audio form, please do subscribe to our social channels across social media at Real Deal Pods. Uh, you should be seeing our handle on the screen throughout the podcast. Until the next time, everyone stay healthy. We will see you guys soon again. Take care.